Hello, everyone. Welcome to SharePoint Power Hour. Um, this is the business solutions team at Rackspace. Uh, and if you are watching for the first time, we do uh, this Power Hour every Wednesday. Um, and we usually cover topics that are related to SharePoint uh, business solutions, so things that you can do out of the box. Um, we don't really always focus too heavily on um, development. We do some um, administration type stuff, but a lot of it is just kind of focused on power users and end users and the things that they would deal with um, in SharePoint. Um, I am Joelle Farley. Uh, I am a consultant on the team, uh, and I have worked with SharePoint for about seven or eight years now, uh, and I am based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, today I am actually doing the second half of the governance kind of discussion and planning uh, presentation presentation that we went through last week, so we uh, only got through about half of it, um, so I'm going to finish that up today. Uh, and hopefully if you guys have questions, um, or you ho hopefully you brought some questions, uh, feel free to put those into the Q&A um, area um, as I go through and we will make sure to cover them. Uh, and just so if you're watching on YouTube, uh, that you should see the Q&A uh, button. If you click that, it'll take you over to Google+, and then you'll be able to put in questions and kind of interact with us live as we go through the, the session today. Um, so Laura, as you probably noticed, since I am not Laura, um, Laura is not joining us today. She's actually teaching uh, our online power user class this week. Um, so she will, I'm sure she'll be back uh, next week. Um, but I will go ahead and let the rest of my team um, introduce themselves and then uh, I'll get started. So Stephen, you want to go first? Hello, I'm Stephen Wilson. I'm part of the business solutions team here at Rackspace. I do a lot of our uh, installs for customers who are not hosted at Rackspace, a lot of migrations, help out customers who are just starting with SharePoint, just sort of the, I have Share or I have, you know, a freshly installed SharePoint farm, what are my next steps? Uh, and then eventually I hand them off to one of our, our uh, solutions builders for when they get outside, excuse me, outside the scope of normal SharePoint usage. All right, Tanya. Hi, I'm Tanya Kaiser. Um, I am a SharePoint admin on the services team. I've been working with SharePoint for a couple of years now, and I'm actually the admin for our internal SharePoint farm here at Rackspace. Um, I'm located in San Antonio, Texas at Rackspace headquarters, or as we call the castle. So there's usually some activity behind me, but I deal with um, you know common user requests. My, my users happen to be my fellow Rackers. But everything from, you know, what does this out-of-the-box web part do to how can I get SharePoint do this? So uh, we run a completely, you know, dedicated farm here at Rackspace, and we use all the out-of-the-box components. So everything that we cover in Power Hour is the sort of stuff that I apply every day. And I am Tavis Lovell. Am I on mute? No, nope. we can All right, awesome. Uh, I'm a business intelligence developer on the business solutions team at Rackspace, and I deal with uh, a lot of things that uh, relate to reporting, so reporting services, performance point, power pivot, things like that inside of SharePoint. And I've been doing that, uh, dealing with business intelligence on the Microsoft stack pretty much exclusively since about 2005 or six. That is all. All right. Awesome. All right, let me go ahead and I am going to share my presentation. I'll kind of do a quick review of what I talked about uh, last week for those that are that didn't get a chance to attend that yet. Uh, and then we'll jump right into the next piece. So just bear with me one second. All right. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Uh, and just let me know if you can't. I'll kind of go ahead and go through this. So uh, as I mentioned last week, we started this governance planning uh, presentation. And I just kind of talked about a high level what um, the gov governance plans are and kind of just preparing uh, for your governance planning and, and getting your governance team together. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned was that 
governance is made up of three different parts, especially uh, in 2013 we kind of have it separated into these three different areas. Uh, we have IT governance, uh, information management, and application management. So last week I kind of got through IT governance and, and IT governance is going to um, be made up of two different things that I, I went through um, last time around. Uh, the first part of that is just your team and communication and that could be uh, it's related to your governance team and, and as well as the support team for SharePoint um, in your organization uh, and getting your communication plan together, knowing what your future direction is, how are you going to handle things like user adoption and training and support, having kind of your, your support model um, detailed and, and available in the document. Um, so you can uh, go ahead and, and take a look at that. So then we have infrastructure and platform management. Um, this is going to be a lot of the stuff uh, that we deal with on the administrative side. Um, so SharePoint admin, central admin, that kind of thing. So you have things like, you know, your service level agreements, you know, service guidelines around service packs and patching, um, other policies, backup and recovery, site policy storage quotas, language support, um, and all of those things uh, that we have on that side of the house. So we, we talked through um, that last week and I think I just saw somebody um, ask if they can you can replay part one I haven't seen it yet uh, you can if you just go to our YouTube channel and look for our I think it was called governance part one uh, if you look for that it was the last video I think that we uploaded um, so you should be able to get it there uh, and that question was asked by Anne um, so yeah, so you can get that. Uh, so today, um, what I'm going to do is I want to, we, we kind of, that's where we wrapped up last week was with IT governance because there's a lot of different things to talk about there. Um, but now we're going to go into information management um, and just as a quick review before I go into uh, the detail of, of that area is just so to kind of explain what information management is. Uh, so basically we're looking at things uh, related to the information architecture. Um, so information architecture or governance is usually going to cover things like your site collection, your site structure, your site collections and site structure, navigation, your the types of content, tagging, managing metadata search, etc. Um, it's also going to get into things for your, like if you do have content types um, that you have um, placed inside of your, in your environment, then, you know, looking at things, uh, looking at the life cycle for those content types. So is content approval required? Um, what about versioning? How are you going to handle versioning? Uh, is there going to be any kind of retention or audit policies that are going to be put in place for specific types of content? So basically taking your content types and coming up with a, a kind of a map or life cycle for each one. And then the second ha half of information management, of course, is going to be really geared towards information access, uh, which is really important and it's, it's one of the, the big things that you should definitely cover in a governance plan. So things like will um, Active Directory groups or SharePoint groups be used, who can manage permissions, um, and where, and then will anonymous access be an option, and does are you going to use any audience targeting like on your home page or anything like that. Um, so just kind of making sure those things are covered as well. And then application management is the, the, well, the last section, uh, and this is really where we lay down the law on thing, all things custom, so things like, you know, the usage of third-party applications, uh, if you are, if you do have a SharePoint developer in-house, then um, anything that you're going to do custom, anything that developer is going to, you know, create custom, um, and then also branding kind of falls into this, so if you are creating your own master page or you're working with any kind of um, CSS files or anything like that inside of SharePoint, then also making sure you kind of have guidelines and stuff around that. Uh, and just within that same thing, just because we're talking about custom applications and, and there's a whole, you know, the testing part of that, um, this, this application management is also going to cover dev environments and QA environments and that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll talk more about that in just a bit. So we left off with IT governance, as I mentioned. So here, uh, each of these slides it basically contains the things. Some of the bullet points is what what I would go look at this as is these are probably going to be the bullet points uh, in this specific section of your governance plan. So you would have one with your um, the diagram of your farm, your browser office requirements, backup and recovery, and then each of those in each of those bullet under each of those bullet points, you're going to have detail about those those topics and and what's going on with those. In, in your in your environment. 
So information management. Um, so governance planning is a good time to review your information architecture. Uh, you want to make sure that with information architecture, we, we've I know that we have had on Power Hour, we've had you know several different um, sessions where we've kind of talked about information architecture and planning and that kind of thing. Um, but just kind of at a high level, since we're really focused on governance, I still wanted to talk about it, but um, just at a high level, your information architecture really should support at least the following three goals. So you want it to be something that can be managed, so you don't want to get so crazy that, you know, nobody can actually keep up and, and follow the architecture. Uh, so something that can be manageable, that's manageable. Um, you want to meet the requirements of the organization. So you want to actually make sure that it's useful to your users. So whatever, if you're deciding to do, you know, something custom with search or you're deciding to use certain kinds of content types or tagging, you just want to make sure that it actually meets the requirements. And then also that it increases effectiveness. So sometimes, uh, which is probably the the rare problem because most of the time we just have people not really using <laughs> things like content types or metadata they tend to just rely on folders um, but sometimes occasionally uh, we do have situations where people will overuse things that they don't really need to uh, so maybe they'll you know put make everything a content type that really doesn't need to be or they'll you know make search really complicated they'll add a bunch of refiners that they don't really need or they just kind of overdo it um, so you just want to make sure that anything that you're planning in your information architecture is actually going to increase the effectiveness of the system and your users uh, and not just not just use features just to use features so make sure that it actually makes sense uh, so those are kind of the three high level main goals that we have when we're dealing with information architecture and it's something to keep in mind when you're kind of outlining your IA and talking about it in your governance plan so some additional questions to consider uh, when planning information architecture from kind of from a governance perspective um, is, uh, and we'll talk through each of these, so how will the site or solution be structured and divided into a set of site collections and sites? So that's probably one of the big things that you want to think about is, you know, are you going to have multiple web apps? web applications? Are you going to have site collections underneath those web apps and how many? Um, are you going to um, are you going to you know want things in separate content databases because they may need to be moved off or or, or changed over at some point? Um, so you want to think of things like that and just make sure that as you you know determine how those things are going to be divided up that it makes sense. Um, also, you know how will data be presented? So are you going to create you know are you going to have a home page? Um, you know how are things going to be presented to the users? Are you going to you know train power users on how to add web parts to pages and sites so that things look really nice and are easy to use for end users? Um, and that kind of thing. You know, how will site users navigate? So one of the big things that we typically cover while we're planning is we're going to cover the navigation. So um, if you're dealing with an intranet situation, you really want to think about, you know, what does your top level navigation need to show? Uh, and also, um, are you going to have everything listed in your navigation? Are you going to point them more to use search? Uh, are you going to kind of feature search more heavily, the search bar more heavily? Or are you going to really just have the tabs running across the top that they can have, you know, that they have drop down menus to get to stuff? Uh, so just thinking through that. How will search be configured and optimized? Are you going to crawl things outside of SharePoint? Are you going to set up uh, custom refiners, that kind of thing? Uh, how can you organize content so that search return useful returns useful results? That's really key, especially in 2013. Just making sure that um, oh, I think we you know in my experience, search has kind of taken such uh, a back seat to everything else with information architecture when we were planning things for 2007 or 2010. Like you would talk about search, but it was it was just like it was kind of like its own thing. You were like, oh well, yeah, there's search. It doesn't really work that great, but we need to make sure that it's you know available. Um, but really, in 2013, you really have to keep search in mind um, when you are doing a lot of this planning because it's become so powerful and so prevalent in a lot of the features that we have in 2013. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, and then I, I Anne just commented and said, have you checked for gremlins? That's, I should definitely add that because that's something that we should <laughs> look out for uh, when we're, we're doing information architecture planning. So that's a good one. Thanks, Anne. 
Um, so some other stuff, uh, what types of content will live on sites, you know, so that kind of goes up to, you know, how it's divided up. Will the content, how will it be tagged and how will metadata be managed? That's really important. Does any of the content on the sites have unique security needs? So identifying your content, you know, if any of your content types or the, or the list or libraries that you're creating have unique security needs. What is the authoritative source for terms? Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that I usually highly recommend is using the term store for meta managed metadata in conjunction with just creating uh, site columns and regular columns. Uh, and so you, what you want to do as a part of your governance plan is decide, you know, how are you going to split up terms in the term store? Are you going to have different groups uh, that you <clears throat> add terms into? And then who is going to be responsible for those? Uh, typically, one of the best things I, one of the best solutions I've seen is if you're dealing with an intranet situation, um, is to create groups for each of your business units or departments. So you may have a group for HR terms, a group for IT terms, a group for finance terms, etc. Uh, and then you can let the power user or site admin from that area manage the terms in that term set. And then that way, not everything has to filter through IT. You know, they can go in there and make changes and corrections and stuff like that as they need to. If I can hop in on that one real sure. quick. Uh, I get that question a lot from people who are just starting out. And the thing I always recommend because they're like, well, should we use you know, an Active Directory group or should we use a SharePoint group? If you have Active Directory groups that already exist for another purpose, for example, like you've got an Active Directory group for all your HI, HR people, and every time you know someone is hired they automatically get put in that group and every time someone leaves the company to get taken out or every time they leave that department they get taken out if those are already maintained and they already exist that's when you would maybe use them for SharePoint but you just wouldn't normally cr create an ad hoc AD group just to use in SharePoint you know if exactly. it's just for SharePoint use a SharePoint group and kind of piggybacking off of that comment, I mean, this is, you know, other stuff going to governance in your architecture. You want to make sure that, you know, your SharePoint environment and your Active Directory environment are on the same domain. Because if you do plan to use Active Directory groups within SharePoint, you know, you may have some issues where you have to extend trust between those domains. So just goes to the larger, you know, have some of this stuff thought out ahead of time. Make sure that your SharePoint team is communicating with your Active Directory team and your Exchange team, and everybody's kind of on the same page. Yep, exactly. All right. Um, how will information be targeted at specific audiences? Are you going to use audience targeting, and what does that mean? Where are you going to use it? Uh, also, keeping in mind that that audience does not equal security, um, and just kind of having guidelines around that. Uh, do you need to have language or product specific versions of your sites? Um, so that's something also to identify early on. And then who will write content for the site and what method will be used to publish it? So thinking about your power users, you know, what does it take if you want to be a power user? What, what process do you have to go through to become a power user? What training is required for that? Um, and then once you have that access, you know, what are the things that you can actually do on the site? Um, sometimes we have, you know, power users are the ones that will manage the security on a, on a specific site that they have access to do so. Uh, other, other times we'll have situations where there's a site admin and then they can manage security and then the power user is the one that's actually kind of managing the content so you, there's a separation there. It really just depends on what works best for your organization but it's something that you definitely want to you know have thought out before you release SharePoint to everyone. <clears throat> Alright so now kind of getting into since we talked a little bit about um, the information architecture and things that you want to think about and, and prepare to document. Um, we also want to look at some of the th other things that you definitely want to um, have in your governance plan. So for information architecture, we, you really want to have detail around your homepage if you're dealing with an intranet uh, type situation, your homepage and your navigation. Uh, you want to have details around those and you also want to detail 
what are the what are the policies for ch making changes to those areas? So who manages the home page? Who manages the navigation? And then if a change needs to be made, what is the process for getting that change made? Um, so maybe the home and because obviously with the home page there could be changes that are regarding branding. So that might be a whole another process, uh, or it could just be that they want to add a new web part or something. So you want to just make sure that there's ownership there. So you know maybe your um, HR department's going to own the home page, or IT is going to own the home page, uh, and then when when changes need to be made, they're you know made through a, a ticket or something like that, or requested through a ticket. Um, just having that policy kind of documented is is really important, especially for those 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 areas. The home page navigation are really important because they're typically the things that all your if you're dealing with an internet, they're the things that all your end users are going to look at. Um, so that's that's important there. Uh, managed metadata, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, so the term store, making sure that you identify what groups are going to be in the term store, and then um, you know saying you know who will own those groups. As I mentioned before, one of the one of the um, things that I typically go with is like an HR group, an IT group, a finance group, basically a group for every business. Uh, unit or department that makes sense because obviously you may not have to add every single one. They may not have their own terms. They may just point to existing terms. Uh, but you definitely want to, you know, have that out there and then assign ownership so that not, it doesn't always have to come back through IT. And then the content type hub. Um, so we talked uh, in the last slide. I mentioned kind of having an idea of how you're going to split up your site collections and if you're going to have different web apps and that kind of thing. Uh, the content type hub, what that is, is that is a tool. Um, you can basically create a site collection um, in, sh in SharePoint, and you can make it a content type hub. Uh, what that means is that you can then create all your content types and manage all your content types from that site collection. And then you can have all of your other site collections basically inherit from that. And that way, if you did have, if you had a situation where you, maybe because you have a lot of content, there's a lot of information out there, you have things split up into different site collections, then you could easily, you know, still centrally manage content types across the environment. Um, so you want to think through um, if, if a content type hub is necessary for what you have. Um, if you're only dealing with one site collection, then it's probably not. Um, but if you see that you're going to have multiple site collections or you see that there's going to be a lot of growth, then you may want to go ahead and implement that and then also come up with, you know, who's going to have permission to that area and who's going to be able to manage those content types. And if you do have content types in your content type hub, maybe that's just the high-level stuff that everybody uses, and then you're going to allow um, your your site admins on the on the subsites and things like that in your site collections to manage their own content types on their level. So just kind of come thinking through that is pretty important. Um, with search, <clears throat> so the things to think about here, uh, your refiners. So what I mean by refiners is right now out of the box, if I go in and I type a search in my 2013 site, then I can see things like um, on the left-hand side, I'll see refiners for things like the, the type of document or type of file it is. Um, I'll see the author uh, refiner, and then I can see like a, a modified date refiner. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times those are those are helpful, sure, but you know usually we're because of how easy it is to add new refiners in 2013. There's probably going to be some customization there. Maybe you want to add a refiner for department because you're going to be you know tagging auto tagging documents with what department they belong to, or just anything like that. So you want to have your own refiners, making sure you document that, and then who owns it. Result sources. Uh, this is kind of result sources are the things that you would be crawling uh, besides just regular SharePoint stuff. Um, so you may ha you're obviously going to have inside of SharePoint you'll have things like videos and conversations and pictures and and these different things that that kind of get crawled and indexed um, separately from each other. But then you what you may want to do is maybe you have a file share that you're not migrating to SharePoint or you have another um, application outside of SharePoint that you want SharePoint to crawl and look at content from. So that way your users can really truly get uh, the enterprise search experience from SharePoint. So making sure that with those things, you know, you, you detail, you know, who's going to own them uh, and what will the, what the process will be if something breaks um, or if there's a new one that needs to be added, just kind of having that detail. And then reporting, there are search reports. Um, that are available now. One of the things I recommend, and I mentioned this in the last session, 
um, is to run all of the search reports um, that that you have, uh, especially when your for your governance team is starting first starting to meet, and you're first starting to um, kind of roll out a new SharePoint site or environment. Uh, to run those search reports to see, you know, what are people looking for? Are they getting any abandoned queries, meaning they search for something, it doesn't give them any results, so they don't click on anything? Uh, looking at that kind of stuff and seeing uh, what tweaks may need to be made. And then versioning <coughs> and approval. So versioning is should be self-explanatory for most people. You just want to, you know, if you're going to have versioning, if you're going to set any policies on versioning across the board, or are you going to do that on each content type level? Or are you going to let the site admin power user type person kind of decide on that? Uh, so just having that detailed. And then same with approval. So um, you know what areas are going to, what areas of content are going to require approval? So maybe like the home page, um, if somebody makes a change to, let's say if you have a page off the home page that shows like the CEO um, blog or it's, uh, you know, it has like about the senior leadership team or something. It's just like an informational page. If a change needs to be made to that, you, pro you might want to put in an approval process so that somebody makes the change and then somebody else basically approves it and then lets it go live. Uh, so that might be an example and just want to have um, the details about that. And then I have this... Um, little uh, image here and it, I pulled it from that that 2013 governance poster that I mentioned that I'll be linking at the end of the session today. So basically uh, it talks about using metadata to enable search and comparisons, managing versions and records, catalog and store information properly, design navigation to help users find important information, integrate information architecture with search, and define publishing strategy. So those are the those are the six areas um, that your governance plan for your IA should focus on or take a look at. All right. So information management continued. Now we're going to talk about information access. So uh, the areas that you should uh, cover. In, in for, for information access is the permission levels. So are you just going to have the default be available? Do you need to create any custom permission levels? So you guys know permission levels, um, just in case you're not familiar with what I mean there. I'm talking about contribute and read and edit and um, design and full control and all those, those out-of-the-box permission levels that we have. So you're going to just use the default if you're going to use the default, then you can list those. Um, or are you going to customize any? Sometimes um, I will, uh, well, not really sometimes, but I will often have um, uh, somebody request that a permission level be created called something like contribute without delete. So right now the contribute out of the box that allows you to add and edit content, but it does, it does also allow you to delete content as well. Uh, so sometimes I will have the request to create uh, a permission level called contribute without delete. So you can go in there, customize that. Um, it does the exact same thing, only they won't be able to delete versions or documents or items. Um, so it's just something that might be helpful. So making sure you put that there. If you're going to not include any, uh, a lot of times in 2013 I'm seeing that people do not want to include the edit permission as an option. So then you can determine, um, you can set that in here as well or, or kind of state that. Uh, security groups, uh, just like um, Stephen was talking about earlier, so you want to make sure that you discuss, you know, when are we going to, you know, use AD groups. So maybe we're going to use AD groups on our home page and our top level because we, we can just include all end users. Um, and then maybe on our subsites for our department, so like our HR site, you know, we probably are going to allow some kind of site admin or power user to manage permission there. So we might want to use a share SharePoint group there uh, so they could easily add and remove people without having to depend on uh, IT to do that all the time with an AD group. Um, so just thinking through that, uh, like Stephen said, probably, you know, what I, what we recommend the most or what we see the most is a hybrid. So you see AD groups in areas that are tightly controlled and you see um, SharePoint groups usually in the areas that are more kind of loosely controlled or more um, apt for collaboration. 
And then just having your general roles and responsibilities. I've mentioned it a few times. So things like, you know, what is your SharePoint admin? Uh, who is your SharePoint admin? That's the person that's probably going to have access to everything, all your envi all your your full environment. So who are they? What exact what do they have access to do? Uh, your site collection admin. So that's the person who's over your what they call the SCA. This person that's over the entire site collection. Your site admin, so those are maybe if you're looking at an intranet, your intranet is your site collection, and then maybe you have like an HR subsite or IT subsite, and you have specific site admins that can manage stuff um, on that level. And then looking at power users versus end users and, and how you're going to kind of classify and the permissions you're going to give to those people. Audiences. Um, I don't see audiences in, in use as much as I used to. Uh, maybe I guess maybe on public sites still, um, but uh, typically if I do see it, it's on a home page. So maybe you're going to have a web part that if I am in this audience, I see this web part. If I'm in this audience, I'm going to see a different web part on the home page. Um, so just making sure. But once again, it's not security. It's really just about you know kind of your viewing experience, the end user's experience when they when they come to the site. So just kind of thinking through that. Search, um, anything that should never appear in search. So search is security trimmed by default, meaning if I uh, am somebody with full control of a site um, and I go and I do a query, I search for something, uh, I'm probably going to see a lot of results where if I was somebody who was read-only, I may query and I may not see as much uh, depending on you know where I have where I have security on that on that site. So um, search is security trimmed. However, there might be for, um, you know, uh, my, my mind just went blank. <laughs> uh, what is the, um, the word for, like, government? Ah, oh, crap. This is what happens when you're, when you're talking a lot. I'm trying to think of the word. It starts with a C. No, it starts with a C. Compliance. Yes. It came. It came to me, guys. All right, so compliance, <laughs> for compliance purposes, you know, just the security trimming, it may not be enough, so there may actually be a specific site or maybe a document library that has documents that should never be searchable, uh, so you can actually turn that off in the li on the library itself and so that it will never appear, never gets crawled, never gets indexed, um, so you can go ahead and uh, do that. Uh, information rights management. Um, so if you are going to do things, uh, or information rights management, I have a link there, and I'll put that into um, into the into our little sharing link sharing tool. Uh, but information rights management, it can be uh, a pain in the butt to um, put into place. Basically, what that is is that is where if I open a document, even if I have read-only right now, if I open a document, I could download that document, I could screenshot it, I could copy and paste from it. Uh, information rights management is, is a feature that you can uh, enable and, and get put into place uh, within your, your environment so that you cannot, a user cannot screenshot, they cannot uh, copy and paste, they can't do anything with the document besides just open it and view it inside the browser, inside their application, but they won't be able to actually do uh, anything outside of that. And Stephen, do you know anything, do you have any other, I'm sure you probably have heard information rights management more than I have as a business user person, but do you uh, have any kind of... The information ma rights management stuff, it has to tie to infra information rights management that's installed in AD, so it it takes a little more than just SharePoint to get it rolling. Uh, right. A lot of our customers are interested in it initially, but the thing to remember about information rights management in SharePoint and pretty much any uh, business environment is that it's, it's like a bulletproof vest. It's not really bulletproof. It's bullet resistant. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to absolutely be able to lock down things, the IRM is not going to be your your way to go. Uh, so you, you have to have a, a really clear use for it and it's almost an, a, a governance topic of its own. Like you have to sit down and consider all of these things that you're talking about for governance but you need to look at them from the information rights management perspective. So it's not something that just because it's like, oh we can keep people from printing documents, great. You're probably not going to want to go down that route just for that one feature. So be sure that you have a, a defined reason for for doing it in the first place. Yeah, and I've heard from just people that I know who have kind of gone down that path that it is a beast. It I've is a bit of a is. beast to set up, and yeah. it's 
<clears throat> and and once it's set up, it usually ends up being profoundly inconvenient, uh, which, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, that seems like the purpose, but then, you know, once you really dig into it, you realize you didn't want it to be that inconvenient. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, locking your door with a, a welding torch. Like, <laughs> <you know? laughs> like, it does the job, but not exactly the best scenario, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> When it takes you an hour to get in every day, you start to rethink it. Yeah. Makes sense. All right, thanks. Um, and then I, I did put in uh, from that, once again, from that governance poster, there's a little image here, and it talks about um, how do I structure permission in a site? How do I target content to a specific audience? Should I use IRM to protect content? Um, how do I make this content accessible to external users? So another piece of this is if you are going to have an extranet or you're dealing with a public site, then there's a whole there's there's more considerations to be made there. And then how do I make sure that only people who need access have it? So just kind of thinking through some of that. Those are the questions that you're probably going to be asking um, as you plan and um, prepare your governance plan document. All right. So um, information management continued. A couple other areas I'll just kind of talk about briefly. So information management policies, this is a different from the um, information rights management. <laughs> There's a lot of information. Like, I bet if we counted how many times I'm saying information, it would be, be rather high. But uh, information management policy. So what this is, is this is something that you can actually set on the content type level or on the, the library or list level. Um, and it allows you to do things with retention and auditing. So basically, you set a policy and you say, if um, I have a content type called forms, and I want these forms basically every time somebody deletes them or edits them, I want it to run in the audit report of the site, then you can turn that on in your information management policy. Or if it's a specific document type that um, you only want to be kept for two years after it's last modified, um, then you can actually set up a retention policy that will either move it to the recycle bin or you can have it move it to another library and another site collection. So you can have uh, this kind of, it's almost like an um, audit and um, uh, gosh, I'm like blanking like crazy today. Audit and what's the word I'm looking for? Hold on. I said it earlier. Now I'm going to go back. <laughs> uh, audit and archive. Woof. Something I apparently did not have Wheaties this morning or whatever. But uh, all right. So audit and archive. Um, information management policy is going to allow you to work with an archive and it's also going to allow you to do auditing. So once again, when you're thinking about your content types, just think through uh, which of those may need this retention or this auditing um, turned on. Um, auditing, uh, I will mention this really quick, so auditing is something that can actually be turned on at the site level. Uh, don't ever do that. <laughs> Just don't ever do that. Just just trust me. If you need auditing, put it on on your library or content type level. Do not put it on at the site level because that is a report that is generating, um, you know, once a, a day or more. Uh, and if you're auditing every time somebody opens a document on your site <laughs> or every time somebody edits a document on your site, that's going to be quite painful uh, for that report to kind of get generated and, and get spit out every day. So definitely don't do that uh, under, I would say, under any circumstances, unless you know that you have a very small site with very specific content and you need to know when things are deleted or whatever, you know, maybe you could use it there, but otherwise just keep it to the content type or library level. You're going to have a lot better of a time if you're doing that. Um, we also have a content organizer. Um, if you've worked with the content organizer, we have had session, power hour sessions on this before. Um, so the content organizer is basically the idea there is you can, uh, it would be where you would drop documents off in a, in a drop-off library and then depending on their metadata or information within them, they would get sent to the correct uh, library uh, within the site. Um, so if you are going to use the content organizer, uh, you know, who's going to manage it, what are the, the pieces of content that, that metadata that needs to be added and that kind of thing. Um, and then govern your content by using tools for content management. So this is kind of goes into some of these things I mentioned above. So use workflows and approvals for document signers and site pages. Use approval for published websites to control pages. Version history, we talked about that. 
content types with auditing and expiration for document libraries to manage document lifecycle, uh, managing libraries using the content organizer, and then site policies to manage site collection lifecycle. So just thinking of, you know, you don't, if you know that you're, you have a library where there's thousands of documents, new documents added in every year, um, then, you know, definitely come up with some kind of archive process for that. You know, don't just let it, don't just put it out there and think that it's just, everything's going to be just fine in a couple of years. You know, definitely, if you know that there's a huge growth potential with a specific library, go ahead and do the work now to come up with a policy, create an archive in another area, have that retention policy moving those things after a certain amount of time. You know, definitely think through that and get that in place now, so then less painful to deal with later. All right, so our final section, and this one probably will go pretty quickly, so if you guys have questions, get them ready. Um, so application management, um, this is going to be where, uh, as I mentioned, you're going to lay down the law in your custom area. Uh, so your customization policy, you know, what are, when are you going to look at third-party tools or, or uh, specifically, especially custom uh, applications outside of just out-of-the-box features. Uh, Lifecycle management, are you going to have, how many, are you going to have a dev environment, a QA environment, are you going to have just one, are you going to have none, you know, thinking through that. Branding changes, so if something has to be changed in the master page or the CSS files uh, that, that are a part of your site, you know, who's going to do it and what's the process. And then solutions versus apps, which I'll talk a little bit about. So the things that you are going to look at in application management are your service level descriptions, your process for analyzing, uh, process for piloting and testing customizations, guidelines for packaging and deploying. Uh, we'll talk about packaging and deploying when we talk about solutions versus apps in a second. Uh, specific policies regarding the types of customization. So if, is it a third party tool? Um, is it something that you're, is it a new web part that somebody's building or is it an entirely custom site or app? Uh, who is responsible for ongoing code support, approved tools for customization. If you're talking about branding, then are you only going to allow them to use SharePoint Designer or are you going to let them use, uh, in 2013, we now can use some of the other kind of design tools and, and point them into SharePoint. Uh, and then also guidelines for updating the customization. So those are just some of the things to think about. Uh, so solutions versus apps. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a very, uh, a new thing that a lot of people have to bring in or consider when they're talking about managing custom, custom things in SharePoint 2013. So you have apps um, and then you have solutions. So apps is kind of the new kid on the block. Um, this is going to be, apps are going to be easier for users uh, and owner, site owners and things like that to discover and install. Uh, they use safe SharePoint extensions. They provide flexibility to develop future upgrades. You can integrate with cloud-based resources and then are available for both SharePoint Online and on-premise SharePoint sites. So that's kind of a, a benefit there if you are an Office 365 person or you're dealing with, you have your, your stuff is out in Office 365. Uh, you, and then solutions is kind of where we've always been uh, with custom stuff in, in, in SharePoint. So solutions are, they can access the server-side object model APIs that are needed to extend SharePoint management configuration and security. They can extend central admin, Windows PowerShell, timer jobs, custom backups, etc. They are installed by administrator, so typically your solution, it's not something that uh, a power user or site owner could go out and grab like an app. Uh, it's going to be installed by an admin. Uh, and then can have farm, web application, or site collection scope. Uh, however, the one thing about solutions is that your SharePoint online availability is probably not really there. Um, so the difference here is that solutions are typically, what I see for the most part, are apps or, or usually simple things like web parts or whatever that we're building custom, uh, whereas solutions are going to be more complex um, custom things that we need inside of SharePoint. And so they'll kind of lean towards using those instead of using um, apps. But just making sure that which, whichever way you decide to go, that you kind of have a um, customization policy for each. So if you're going to do apps, then here's what we need to do. Here's how we're, here's where we're going to test them. Here's where we're going to, you know, put them. This is, you know, we're going to pilot them this way. Um, and then if you're doing with solutions, making sure you have that same detail. So that's kind of the difference between the two there. 
Um, and then also uh, talking about apps, so besides just, you know, your own custom things that you're developing and putting out there, but also, you know, you want to think about, because your power users are going to find out about it. You can try your best to hide it, but I promise they're going to find out. Uh, the App Store uh, in SharePoint, so basically in 2013, uh, we now have access, as long as your environment's kind of configured correctly, uh, you're, you can now access the SharePoint App Store, which is similar to, oops, excuse me, uh, similar to um, the uh, the app stores that you have for like Android or, or Apple and that kind of thing. Um, so what you can um, do here is you want to think about, you know, if a power user goes out to that app store um, online and they, you know, see something that they want, they want a web part on their site, um, and if you don't put any, you know, governance in place and you just kind of let it be a free-for-all, <laughs> then you, could, you can imagine people are going out there, they're downloading things, because a lot of those things are free, so there's no cost involved. So they may go out there, they're downloading all kinds of um, apps and that kind of thing. A lot of people will laugh at me because, let me see if I can pull this up really quick, just kind of as a, a funny thing. Bear with me just a second. Because I have an Office 365 site that is kind of my personal site that I use just to kind of mess with, uh, test stuff out in Office 365 and work with it a little bit. So I want to show you guys something really fast. And of course, my site's going to take forever to load. I'm already a little scared. Uh, you're scared? While you're while you're loading that up, uh, we have a question. Anne Loveless says she can't watch episode 82. I don't know why, Anne. I went out to YouTube after I saw your question, and I loaded it up, and it seemed to work just fine. So I don't know if you're having a problem with YouTube itself, but the video seems to work. Uh, I've tried it in two browsers so far, and it's it fires right up. So I mm -hmm. wish I had more for you, but... Yeah, we could put a link to it, too. Um, I can put that out there. All right, so um, my point of this, this is really kind of silly. It took me this time just to show this, but I thought it was funny. I went a little app crazy uh, when I got my Office 365 site. So I was just like, all the apps, download them all. And as you can see, <laughs> uh, even things like cheeseburgers was something that I could download into my... Uh, SharePoint site. So if, <laughs> as you may imagine, if it's not governed and controlled, things could get out of hand like they did in Joelle's Office 365 site. Um, so with that said, uh, what do you, what you want to do there is while your uh, the governance team needs to think about you know whether users can purchase or download apps from the App Store and if they can you know what level of user can do that um, if there is a way when you're setting up your the the kind of the App Store thing you can actually put in um, you know if if there is an approval needed so basically I could as a power user I might be able to go out there uh, and click download but then it's going to tell me that it requires approval uh, and a notification would be sent to whoever is the person that's kind of set to approve that uh, and then they could d deem whether that or not that app gets added. Uh, so my recommendation would be to let users um, click add so that they can actually add them but uh, they won't get added to the site until somebody has time to review it uh, and then the governance team maybe they want to test it and then you can actually you know if it's something that is worthwhile you can you know maybe send out some kind of communication to your users and let them know that it's available now um, so really just kind of making that more efficient uh, make specific apps for the app catalog, make specific apps for SharePoint available to your users by adding them to the app catalog, so that would be what you do once you determine that something looks good. Um, app requests, this is what I said, configure app requests to control which apps are purchased and how many licenses are available, and then monitor specific apps in SharePoint 2013 to check for errors and to track usage. Uh, and then in the SharePoint store, it does give a lot of information, you can, you can, get, you can see reviews uh, and, and that kind of stuff just to kind of determine you know, how good the app is and that kind of thing. All right, um, so that is the end of what I was going to talk about for right now. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead. This is, let me click on this for you. <clears throat> this is uh, the poster I kept mentioning. So this is a link that I'll stick in our um, link area. Uh, this is the What is Governance poster. So if I open the PDF version of this, and it's rather large. 
So let that download for a second. Uh, this is, uh, you'll notice that a lot of the things that I have in my PowerPoint um, were from this. This is a great tool. So this is one of the first times I've actually been very happy with what Microsoft has come out with when it comes to kind of guidelines for governance. Usually it's something that's like, yeah, governance, do that. And that's usually <laughs> the most we get. Uh, but this is actually really helpful. Um, it is very large, as you can see, but you can kind of zoom into it. There's also the, the tool that allows you to kind of work with these, these posters uh, that you can download from Microsoft. Um, but here you can kind of see the details of IT governance and then information management and then application management. So if you just listen to my whole spiel and you don't remember anything, then you can definitely come and get this poster and it will walk you through a lot of the stuff that I, that I talked about. Uh, and I'll stick that link out there um, so that you can get to it. Do you guys have any questions or do you guys have anything else you want to talk about while we're kind of waiting for people to get caught up in the that are viewing? I'm going to try to figure out how to use this showcase thing. And for any of you who are watching <clears throat> on uh, Google Hangouts, if you go to the, the side panel, like you go towards the left side of your screen or, yeah, your left, uh, and you'll see uh, the showcase is just like three, they look almost like price tags uh, held together with a ring. If you click on that, that will bring up the showcase on the side, which is where we can post links to you. YouTube makes it very difficult to post links in the descriptions, so we don't normally put it there. Uh, but we'll try and get something out there so that you can at least copy and paste it. Yep, and I just put, so I just put out the governance planning link that I have on the screen, and then I put out episode 82, which was last week's, uh, for those that were looking for that. So maybe a direct link to that will help. Uh, let me check the Q&A. Oh, the the redacted, Carlos said you mentioned ha possibly having a redacted governance policy we could see. Um, you know what, I did not get a chance to redact one. <laughs> that was my my mistake, I actually forgot about that. Um, let me, I will, let me make it a note right now. And I will get that, um, and we can show that at the end of next week's session. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure what next week's session is yet. I'm not sure if it's out there or not. But um, I can show that at the end. Sorry about that, Carlos, but I'll definitely do that next week kind of give that. Uh, maybe I can put it on my blog too and then I'll share a link to that during next week. <clears throat> I can do that. At least give you kind of a table of contents and some general information. All right. So give it another second. Um, I have an article. Let's see. Oop, there's my email. Uh, I have an article that just went live today that you guys can check out, uh, and I will put a link to it too. Um, so it's not related to governance, but it is uh, three simple ways of putting my sites to use. Um, this is specifically geared towards the folks that um, may not be using Yammer or really focusing in on, on other enterprise social things, but they really, you know, they really, this, the areas that they can do, that they can use, uh, my sites, uh, things like the About Me, where they can actually have people load their past projects and make search a little bit better and kind of create your own subject matter expert search, task aggregation, and then just kind of following document sites and people. Um, so this article went live today, so definitely check it out. I'll put a link to that. Uh, and CMS Wire is a really good uh, resource for kind of just general um, SharePoint news and, and other things about content and collaboration. Let me put that here. All right, anything you guys, any news, training, any upcoming training, Tavis, or anything like that? I don't have another class until next month, but okay. uh, if anybody is looking to beef up on their reporting services skills, we have a reporting services class that goes on every month, usually sometime around the uh, middle of the month. That is a four-hour online class, so uh, it's also pretty cheap, considering that there's no travel and it's all online and not that long. So anyone interested in that, uh, if you type into Google Rackspace reporting services training, You'll get our page. 
I don't have the link up the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check out that page for all our training stuff. Oh, my camera is like, woo. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's it that we have uh, today. So go ahead uh, and join us next week. Have a good day, everyone, and we will we will see you soon. Bye. Bye.